Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proven to work? Medicine. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast, a show about energy healing, holistic, and plant medicine. Our passion is healing on all levels. You'll hear guests from doctors, yoga teachers, energy healers, researchers, coaches, and real people who've recovered from serious debilitating health conditions, getting to the root of the problem and solving it. And this is not medical advice. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. And now your host, William Dickinson. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Holistic Healing Collective podcast. Today, we have our guest, Miranda Viers, who is a some, some form of a psychonaut. She is uh, an individual that supports people to transform their lives using psychedelics. So, as always, I'd like to give, give our guest the platform. Miranda, could you tell us a little bit more about, about you, what it is you do, and particularly how you got into this in, in the first case? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me, first and foremost. My pleasure. Um, so I am a psychedelic support guide, integration coach. I also um, integrate Reiki into um, how I support people utilizing um, what I'll call power plants and mycelium teachers. Um, how I got into this is uh, similar to how many of us heart-centered, health-focused coaches find our way. And that was uh, by hitting my rock bottom. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, you know, really what happened is um, like many of us, I, there was, there were things in my childhood that um, went unprocessed and led me to um, not have a great um, self-worth which led to looking for love in all the wrong places and unhealthy relationships and communication, um, you know, tools and things like that. So yeah, I I really have been struggling, right? I started, began struggling with mental disease early on and played a little bit with pharmaceuticals, played a bit with, um, you know, other substances Mm -hmm. that that were not prescribed by Mm -hmm. all means. And you know, really just came to the conclusion that this was the way that life was. And, and then fast forward to having some kids and throw in a little bit of postpartum depression and kind of added to the mix. Um, I went through, through about five years of um, fertility issues. So so trying to have a second child took us a really long time. And that impacts somebody in many different ways, Um, did not help um, the mental dis-ease I was feeling along the same time period I was struggling with undi- it was undiagnosed at that time back pain and I was given you know the, first it was I weighed too much so I lost weight and then it was my breasts were too big so I got a breast reduction and it turns out you know 12 years later I have I, I was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis <laughs> which is an autoimmune disease mm-hmm. which influences your spine right um, so yeah I did finally have a second child and um, a third one, which was a surprise after um, I fostered my nephew for about six months. So for about six months, I had like twins, uh, babies. Yeah. I mean, it was not really actually. (laughs) I mean, yes, it was cool. And that's really where I I really started sliding down that last slope Mm. of rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was already dealing with postpartum depression and then to add another child and two babies and I had an older boy, an older son. Um, we decided while we had him that um, two kids were good and, and we were going to not have um, mm-hmm. any more. And the day after my nephew went home, I found out I was pregnant again. Wow. So there were a lot of, yeah, right. So, um, and, and, and I can honestly say uh, that, that my third child is um, a spirit guide manifested into physical reality because I was not listening. (laughs) Right. So it was like, here, let me give you a little you to raise. (laughs) Um, so I've learned a lot from him. So I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And that pregnancy was difficult. And, um, because I did have so many mixed emotions and after I had him, um, I was, I was not in a very good state. And I began adding pharmaceutical after pharmaceutical after Mm. pharmaceutical. 
And fast forward many years, and I found myself on a concoction of um, antidepressants. I was on Norco for the pain, ibuprofen, flexor, all muscle relaxers. I was on um, Xanax, and then I was also on 90 to 120 milligrams of Adderall. Wow. So this is what I was taking every day. Yeah. And um, now I understand why I felt the way that I felt. But but then what? how this was all working in my body um, was it would settle right in my heart and in my solar plus solar plexus chakra as this pressure that needed to be mm. released. And the only way that I knew to release that, that I would find any relief was through rage, like mm. yelling, like, mm. like literally like getting this energy out. And unfortunately that was, that was, um, that was traumatizing my kids. Yeah. You know, I was verbally abusing my kids. I was emotionally abusing my kids. With that being said, my kids, I, I was a stay at home mom. My kids also received a lot of love. I wasn't mm -hmm. completely completely gone mm -hmm. to where they didn't know they were loved. And they seen parts of me that, um, as a mother, I'm not, I was not okay with. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty versed in psychology and I knew what I was doing to them. And there was this little piece of me that was witnessing that. Right. Yeah. Went to the doctors, went to therapists. They didn't help. You know, it was a pharmaceutical sales meeting. I had one therapist that just told me I was a lazy bitch. And that was the last time I, Wow. You know, that was, uh, I, I, it took me a long time to step back into talk therapy after that. I can imagine traumatic you know, and experience. And a lot of self work and some ayahuasca. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was horrible. Um, so in, in my mind at that time, I had two choices as a mom. I knew what I was doing to them. And I knew that I had done in my mind, everything that I thought that I knew how to do to, to, to change. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so my choices in my mind were that I could, we could continue on. And, and hope they forgive me someday and I don't fuck them up too much, right? Or I could remove myself from this planet and sure they would deal with the trauma of losing me, but there would be an end to the abuse. Mm -hmm. They would then begin to heal, right? And I was okay with that choice as a mom. I was, it, it was, um, yeah, I was okay with that, especially in that moment. <laughs> I didn't, I yeah. didn't, I didn't yeah. care. That was the choice I, I, I made. And um, I was moments away from, making that happen. And it was nothing short of a divine intervention that, um, it was a voice very much outside of myself, but now I know very much inside myself, um, that just asked me who I was without all these pharmaceuticals. And when the last time I had been chemical free was, you know, um, who is that person had to be better than the person that was sitting there. And, and I owed it to my kids to find out. And I was told that my purpose on this planet was to, to, to quit what I was doing and to find a natural way. And then I would share that with the world. Wow. Because people are hurting. Yeah. It was pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, especially in that moment at a rock bottom point. And it's like, you know, I, at that point it was so overwhelming and um, like I was, there was a little bit of anger, you know what I mean? Cause here I came to this like peace with this decision and now it was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, but I took it pretty literal and I quit everything I was on cold Turkey. Um, How was that? Um, that ensured that things got far worse before they got better. Mm -hmm. I was on some pretty um, hardcore things that you do not quit yes. cold turkey. Do not recommend that to anybody. Please always consult your physician before you do that. I'm very lucky. Um, I'm very lucky, <laughs> um, quite honestly, that I made it through that. But yeah, it got a lot harder. Uh, I was looking to commit myself into a 30-day program um, that would support me holistically with um, detoxing my diet, you know, detoxing um, my body from all of the, the chemicals and things. Um, intuitively, I knew what I needed, um, but I didn't have the money to pay for all that. Mm, yeah. And I needed something that insurance companies would cover. And unfortunately, at least here in the US, our insurance companies cover institutionalized places where it's like, here's more pharmaceuticals, yes. right? So I, I was on my own. I didn't know there was a whole world of like coaching and support, nor was I in a financial position to yeah. even utilize it at that point. So I dove in first with um, mindful self-compassion because I knew that I, there was some forgiveness and self-acceptance um, and, and self-compassion um, that, that I needed before I could even move forward because I was in this, you know, this guilt and this shame cycle that I'd been in my entire life. And in, in all reality, it's probably the same guilt, shame cycle that my family, many of our families have been in for generations, yeah. right? Um, so I began there that taught me how to breathe correctly, you know, cause most of us aren't breathing, even breathing, right. You know, mm -hmm. it's, um, turns out our brain, you know, does need a certain amount of oxygen. <laughs> yeah. 
um, to feel good mentally, right? Um, yeah. So that was a thing. I did um, brain training, neurocore for um, ADHD symptoms, um, a lot of different modalities, essential oils. I, um, I removed the toxic cleaners from my home, um, really just started being mindful of that kind of thing. And then I, so um, my rock bottom point was in April. In August, I began a 12 week nutrition program that um, in hindsight, it really, it really was, they handed me this packet of information and there was one meeting in the beginning and then one meeting in the end, but I also had a personal trainer once a week. Mm. Um, two weeks into that, I wanted to live. And it was like the most profound feeling, like, holy shit, I actually want to do this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? More than just for my kids. And I was both like so proud and I felt so happy in that moment. And then instantly turned to anger because nobody ever stopped to ask me what I was fucking eating mm -hmm. all these years yeah. of going to yeah. the doctor. And nobody said, Hey, are you hitting a drive through once or twice a day by chance? How much coffee do you do? How much caffeine are you intaking? How's your sugar intake? Mm -hmm. Right. Nobody asked me those questions. And then two weeks into um, what I now know is a sub was a sub part, um, like nutrition thing to begin with. It mm -hmm. wasn't even like great. Um, but it was enough for me to realize that shit food actually impacts how we yeah, feel. Very important. Go, go figure. <laughs> who knew, right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I finished up that program before I was done with it. I was enrolled to become a transformational nutrition specialist with the Institute of Transformational Nutrition. Um, but I, I just, because I wanted to live, that dark cloud of depression was still there. I, yeah. I, it, there it, 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 the struggle was still there. I knew that I had not found exactly what I was looking for just yet, right? So I, I continued on my journey, um, did some more meditation courses, mindful, mindful based stress reduction. Um, I did mindful based stress reduction actually twice because uh, it's that great of a course. And then in November, a friend of mine. Um, smoked some DMT without knowing what it was. Mm. So you can imagine how that experience was for her. She, wow. she like flipped out, didn't know what was going on, didn't feel back in her body the next morning. And she reached out to me and asked me to research it for her, which was very weird because she was very much like me into looking into things herself, you know? Mm. So it was interesting. And now we, we joke about it because it's like, we know that we know the trajectory that it was putting yes. me on. But in my research, I came across the word ayahuasca and instantly when I read that word, I have a full body response and, and I knew that's exactly what I was looking for. Mm. I can't describe it any other way than knowing, hey, this is it. This is what yeah. you were looking for. I, know I didn't know there were retreat centers. I didn't know it was a tea. I didn't know, like I, I was clueless. At, I didn't even know mm. what DMT was prior mm. to that, right? <laughs> um, so I then began researching. I spent the next three months researching ayahuasca. I'm looking into the studies that were being done with John Hopkins and the other organizations, um, podcasts, different webinars, reading all the books, um, reaching out to different centers, people that had been to the centers before. So I was vetting, you know, somewhere to go. Um, and then I finally, found, I finally found Eagle Condor Alliance in um, Medellin, Colombia. And um, I was not in a good financial position at that point, and they are one of the few centers that do offer partial scholarships for mm. people who are in real need. And so I applied for that scholarship and, and was accepted. Um, so I found out I was going about eight weeks before I was actually going, which, which was nerve wracking, right? Because mm -hmm. I didn't have a passport. Um, here I was this, you know, as a stay at home mom, my kids were going to a, a private Christian school at this point in time. And now I'm um, going to get on an airplane by myself to go to Colombia, to sit in a maloca with a shaman with jaguar teeth around his neck to drink one of the strongest psychedelic brews <laughs> in the world, right? Amazing. Uh, so it was, it was quite an experience um, moving up to that. But uh, I went to that retreat. It was a 10-day retreat. We utilized three sessions of yaje, which is Colombian ayahuasca. And uh, Wachuma, or also known as San Pedro, which is a mescaline-based cactus. Hmm. Um, when I and I did have some beautiful, like, some very profound moments and, and experiences there. Um, and I can honestly say that when I left there, I can remember being on the airplane, thinking like, "This better have worked because my husband's going to kill me." Because I still had to buy my airfare, right? 
like I, this better have worked. So it wasn't like I had this experience and it was like, oh, light switch, I'm all better. Yeah. Right? I didn't know. Um, I just knew that things were going to be real rough at home if I came home and I was still like this crazy, like rageful bitch, right? <laughs> 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 and and I'm, I'm joking. I'm not like I, I do give myself love in that. But jokingly, yeah. Um, yeah. I say that, you know, but it didn't take me very long to recognize that when I came home, I was changed. It was um and when I say changed, I was falling more in alignment with who I was. Mm -hmm. I was beginning that process. So what did that look like, like tangibly? Um, yeah, so tangibly, th there there was no rage. Mm. Like before I left, there was um, no cloud of depression, like just gone. I, I had so much life and connection to people and to nature. And I wanted nothing more. I want nothing more than to maintain them beautiful connections. And, you know, that was really the first time that I experienced that we are love. Like we mm. are love manifested. Right. So yeah, um, tangibly that cloud of depression has never been back for me. Okay. So that's, that's like the, the, the massive shift. Right. Um, with that being said, um, that was a tool that I utilized. Yes. I was doing the work, yes. right? Yes. These tools open a door for us. They may give us guidance. They may give us wisdom. They may point us in the right direction. We show up and do the work and it's not True. pretty work. It's not, it's not always pretty work, right? The, mm -hmm. Because it's diving into our shadows and finding um, intimacy with ourselves, finding the areas where we're bullshitting ourselves and getting out of our own way. You know, looking at the things that we believe in life and, and, and asking ourselves, is this really my belief or is this a belief that was um, programmed onto mm -hmm. me, right? And so it is, it's, it's like breaking apart every portion of our lives and, and then rebuilding it in alignment with our own authenticity. Yeah. And when, you you've, know, when um, you've adopted a part like that, it almost feels like a part of you is dying when you push that part away. And it, it can be very painful because it's like you're, you're burning part of yourself off for new growth. So it can be very painful, even though it was never actually yours. You've adopted it and it's been with you for so long. It, it hurts to let it go. So it, it isn't always a, a painless process. Sometimes it can be quite difficult. I have never had a journey that was a painless process, to be honest <laughs> with you. I mean, maybe the journey was, but, yeah. but let's be realistic. The journey is the prep work. Working mm -hmm. with the medicine is the prep work. It's what comes at. It's the integration yes. is where, where it's at. And, mm -hmm. and this is, you know, I, what you just said is beautiful because I didn't recognize that in the first couple of years of my work. And I was working alone. I was going there. Was, I had some level of integration support, but nowhere near um, because I did uh, just to, just to clarify, I did continue my work. I've done numerous retreats at this point mm -hmm. with, with these medicines. Um, but I didn't give myself the grace to grieve those parts mm. that I was letting go of. So now I recognize how important allowing a grieving process is when we are letting go of things, mm -hmm. even though these are parts of us that we aren't in alignment with any longer, they're parts of us that were put into place to protect us in yes. one way, shape or Very form true. along the way. And, and so we don't have to hate them. Right. In fact, I invite people to, to, to not hate them, mm. to honor them for the protection that they were offering and to give them a hug and say, I don't, I don't need the protection mm -hmm. anymore. I got this. That's a great, you know, I'm going to try a different way, you know? So that is a huge part of the integration process. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's very important because what you said is very true. These parts, we don't have them for no reason. They're usually protective mechanisms that kept us safe. Most commonly when we were when we were growing up, that's the most common time that we adopt these things. Something that I wanted, wanted to add was a bit of my own personal story. And it's really interesting what you're saying around grieving these parts, because for me, this is, this is very personal to me. So this is my own experience. One of the most difficult and painful things for me to go through so far was to acknowledge how, love, how much love my body actually has for me and how I actually deserve to feel pleasure. And that was a very difficult thing for me to accept because I had a part of me that protected myself because whenever I experienced pleasure in the presence of my father, I would be attacked. So that part was there and it served me and learning that I am actually loved and I deserve to feel good and that my body loves me was like, it feels amazing to experience that, but it's also really hard at the same time because 
you're grieving that protective part and it's like it will also feel sad for all of that love that you have been unaware of and that you've missed for so much of your life so it's grieving what you never actually had it's the, the grief that you never actually had that experience so i imagine this is a very very unique thing that everybody experiences differently how would you help somebody discern if this is something that they should try if this is a, a, a like an avenue that they should pursue sure yeah just like any modality it's not for everybody it's, yeah. it's difficult work um and i also it's very difficult to say who it's for and who it's not mm -hmm. for i've sat in journey with such you know from people on um rock bottom you know a horrible addictions last chance of life to um the the uh, head lawyer of bp gas you know so mm -hmm. i've it's as far as whether this is for you or not um i would say ask your body mm -hmm. do your research um do some research reach out to somebody to get the basics of the substances, a um, little bit of the history of, um, ask yourself why you would wanna utilize these substances, what you would hope to get out of them, how would you know it would be successful, right? And then reach out to somebody like myself uh, or another facilitator, or if you have a friend or a family member that has experience, reach out and speak with somebody who has experience that you can get more intimate with, with your um, personal story so that it can be, you know, looked at, is this a good fit or not? Mm. You know, there are certain um, medical conditions that, that it's, it's not um, generally a great fit for. There are some mm -hmm. medications that are not good um, interactions with um, this is not work for somebody who is not ready for self-acceptance and to move through difficult processes. Um, many people I find are looking for a replacement of their antidepressants and, and these are not that. Mm -hmm. An antidepressant is meant to, um, I'm gonna use my own words, um, dull emotions to an, uh, to an extent so that you're able to cope with life, mm -hmm. right? These things tend to pull out the things that we need to cope with. Mm -hmm. And so we do need to have a certain amount of, of um, resiliency, right? To move through that. And I always recommend support, even for people who have been doing these things on their own for a long time. Um, I can say from personal experience, I, I began utilizing, utilizing LSD in my teens. Um, and I, I, in hindsight, I knew back then that there, I was onto something, but I was programmed into believing it was bad, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, and then I certainly had my recreational experience with psilocybin as well. Um, this is not that. There's a very big difference between utilizing these substances on your own and utilizing these substances with support, with intention, with integration. Um, so yeah, um, and with that being said, part of what I do with my clients is to teach them what I know, teach them how I'm supporting them so that I can empower them to hold their own space or hold space for others, right? Because we can learn to do this on our own with a life team in place, a support, a support system in place, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so I think many people think because these are like sometimes substances that are sort of frowned upon or are generally used somewhat recreationally that they're almost sort of like toys and that they can mm. play with them. When in reality, if you go into these things with this this intention of to, to heal, to integrate, to resolve unresolved issues these things are actually these are very powerful just because they come from nature and they're not uh, pharmaceutical i mean even pharmaceuticals are derived from nature they're all nature-based compounds in a way just sort of concentrated or refined so everything really truly comes from nature anyway and these these aren't toys so you wouldn't recommend this as being a, a first line approach i think as you said yourself this isn't something you just jumped in with you actually were doing 
courses and learning about Reiki and meditation and spirituality. And you were doing all of this. And then this popped up as a, a useful tool, uh, the next stepping stone to help facilitate a, a breakthrough or a higher level of transformation. Yes. So I will say that, um, yes. And right. Mm -hmm. There's always like an, mm -hmm. and, um, some people, this may be a good first offense mm -hmm. for, right. Um, I don't necessarily think somebody needs to be into the spiritual mm -hmm. aspect of things first. What I would recommend if it's possible first is to um, clean up the diet, you know, to address mm -hmm. the, the body, mm -hmm. right? Watch what's going in and on our body, learn um, um, even just a basic meditation that can just be even basic breath work. Mm -hmm. um, those two things right there would, would be my my recommended prerequisites for mm -hmm. somebody who is in a space that can do that. Mm -hmm. A good right? foundation. A good foundation. Yes. For me, the, the other, what I'll say woo woo stuff mm -hmm. um, came after because yeah. I, I wasn't really open to it at okay. that point, quite honestly. So this opened um, you to this, it. This opened me to okay. it. Yeah. Because clearly once you start seeing things that um, once with the experiences that I had, there's no, de there's no denying the woo woo anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, my mentors have this, um, Tom Cole witty, they have this beautiful woo spectrum in it. So it's like, uh -huh. you start at like, 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 um, like anti woo, right? Like mm -hmm. no woo. And mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, I'm woo curious. Uh -huh. And then I'm woo adjacent. And then I'm like, totally woo woo, uh -huh. you know? So I consider myself at that woo adjacent point where I still very much look at, um, you know, research and, and, and data and science mm -hmm. to an extent, I mean, being mindful of who's science. Right. Mm -hmm. And then also incorporating that mysticism piece that is so very real. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, for me, it opened me up to that aspect mm -hmm. of it. Um, I dove into it very much with a science mind of understanding what it was going to do to the chemistry of my brain. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in all actuality, you know, quieting that default mode network, and, and giving me some space from, from that overactive part of, of the mind and then creating new neural pathways and new connections to see things differently. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just a woo woo thing. There's a lot of science around this that talks about how these things work. I know people have done these things under brain scans and you can see how the brain functions differently. It's not just a, a, a magical experience. There is actually physiological things happening. The, as you said, the brain rewiring, rewiring itself. Um, people yeah. talk about memories and things that come up that they haven't had access to. There's that's part of integration. There's so much that that happens in these experiences that isn't that isn't woo woo. And it's like it's difficult to it's really difficult to explain the depth of something like this without having actually experienced it. It's like you're trying to look up the hill. It's really easy to look down. So somebody that has had an experience like this knows what it's like to not have had the experience. But when you're trying to look up, it's like you're trying to look at something that you're, you're just not able to see. It's invisible in front of you. Even though it's there, your brain cannot perceive it. And I know this history because I have had very similar experiences. I started very much like you when I was at my rock bottom, completely science-based. It's like, give me the science. Give me the logic. It's like, I've got a gut problem. It's physiological. I've got fatigue. It's physiological. And there's truth to that. Something that I, I often say is, you cannot meditate yourself out of chemical depression. It's like, if you have molecules in your bloodstream, in your brain that tell you you feel depressed, you will feel depressed. You can't meditate yourself out of that, which is why you need a good foundation. Again, the diet, the basics. But it goes, it goes higher than that. And I think a really interesting way you can look at this is look at how you can think about something stressful. Think about a tiger chasing you. Think about the deadline that you have to work. You feel a physiological response in your body. You feel cortisol, you feel adrenaline. So your body has a physiological response to this, this woo stuff, like emotions are, are woo, right? They're not, they're not so tangible. They're not physical, but they, they facilitate a physiological reaction. So if using these more woo style approaches, we can go in and start looking at these subconscious behavior patterns that we have, these experiences that have fragmented. And like you said, with the neural pathways, maybe they're disconnected. So they've actually physically split apart in the brain. We don't have conscious access to both and temporarily we can jo join these together and resolve this we can actually physiologically rewire the neurons in the brain it's fascinating so it is. 
yeah. I think some some people are are ready to hear this, mm -hmm. um, but this is this is my thought on it, and I'll fully acknowledge that it's completely mm -hmm. my thought on it. But the further I get into this work, the, the more I realize that just looking at our bodies, we're pretty fucking woo. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. like all of this is woo, and all of mm -hmm. this is science, and there there really is this like we've created the separation, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in, but in all actuality, I mm -hmm. mean, look at just even the process of of bringing a human into this mm -hmm. this world. You know what I mean? I mean, what's not woo about that? <laughs> I mean, I get the yeah. science behind it too, and you know, women literally are like the portals of life, bringing one spiritual a spiritual being from one mm -hmm. realm to another mm -hmm. through their body. You know, um, yeah, so yeah, it's pretty like, woo. And even me mainstream science or even alternative science still can't explain where consciousness comes from. It's like, well, where is that? There is no, there is no scientific explanation for that just yet. But I think it's really important that we we marry these two parts together. Again, it's the yin and the yang. It's the duality. We need science. We need logic. We need rationality. We need science. But we need to bind this with this irrational, ethereal, intangible, emotional, to truly understand the whole. Because you you need them. So if you go too far either way, you're out of balance. But if you can bring them both together, you see this truth in both. And they actually both require each other for the whole to work as it does. Yes. Yes. And that same analogy is beautiful when you look at Western medicine versus yes. Eastern medicine as a whole. Very true. It's when the two can hug and, 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 and make friends, mm -hmm. that's when we're going to begin seeing, seeing some massive healing on this planet. And I think we're moving towards that. I think that's actually why yeah. we're here today. <laughs> we are facilitating yeah. that, that transformation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So with all of this in mind, I know this is something that you do. You, you facilitate these, these types of experiences. Something that I wanted to ask you that was sort of like a, more of a personal question, I was just generally interested, is how do you go about organization of these, these types, of types of things? How does this work? So if anyone interested in maybe doing a, a supported psychedelic experience, or I know you do group sessions as well, that's what I'd particularly be interested in hearing about. How does this actually work? What are the logistics of this kind of thing? Yeah, so I work with people on a few different levels. Um, the, the main way I'm working with people right now, or I should say the most popular way I'm working mm -hmm. with people right now is through a virtual group um, microdosing program mm -hmm. where we really get connected with the unique language of our body and create intimacy with ourselves. And, and so it uh, incorporates um, a journal system called the Condor Approach. And when we start body tracking and we overlay a chakra map, and then we take what we know about chakras, right? Like the age they develop and things like that. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful tool to start connecting dots to our trauma timeline. So that's utilized within um, my microdosing mastermind. And the next round of that starts April 24th. Um, it's a 12 week container. Mm -hmm. There's three weeks of intention setting and preparation, getting comfortable with each other in the process six weeks of actu actually working with um, what I'll call the supplements mm -hmm. and then three weeks of integration work after that. I also do one-on-one uh, -on -one work and I invite people to come to Michigan or I can meet them where they are or they can wherever they want to go in the world and I'll meet them mm -hmm. there and we would do um, what I would call an expansive space experience and um, I, I don't just walk in and work with somebody at, for one session, right? There's mm -hmm. a process to it. Mm -hmm. So this would be, you know, there'd be a process leading up to the experience itself. And then there would be um, a, like two sessions, one being like a mini dose session and one being a larger dose session. Mm -hmm. um, I also can create whatever type of experience somebody wants. So if somebody wants 10 days and four experiences, I have the ability to do that. Um, I also have a retreat coming up in April. I plan to do likely two retreats a year, um, one in the U.S. and then one will be outside of the U.S. every year. And so that's another way people can, you know, contact me to learn more on that. Mm -hmm. um, I host a community circle, so local people, and um, we come together and and sit in circle. Um, I, I so I provide a safe container for people to come and and utilize their mycelium teachers, and then we do integration work after that. Um, I do very few, I only do two one-on-one -on -one clients at a time, as far as like a six month basis where we're working through them foundations. We're utilizing the, um, the, the micro dosing as well as mini dosing sessions. Mm -hmm. 
a mini dosing, uh, mini dose session, I think has been um, the most profound thing that some of my clients have been through. This is where somebody takes just like a half a gram and then we get on a Zoom call and we talk for two and a half to four hours mm. about everything that comes up and start processing things. Um, so that's something that I offer. Um, regardless of how I work with people though, you know, I have different things offered. So feel free to, to reach out mm -hmm. at any given mm -hmm. point in time. And I may have something um, new because, uh, because it's my business and I can do what I want, right? Yeah. Which I'm totally loving. <laughs> yeah. I love this. Um, regardless, though, it's important for me to share, I think, the process that I follow. Um, so whether it's microdosing or macrodosing, we go through what, what we call the four ins. We begin with an intake, right? People listening to this right now, they're intaking information mm -hmm. from me. If we get on a free exploration call, we're going to be intaking information from each other. If they choose to move forward, there'll be an in-depth intake form where I'll get a look at um, not only the medical history to make sure what we're doing is safe, but also looking at a trauma timeline so that we can be prepared for the things that may mm -hmm. come up while we're in space with the, the teachers, mm -hmm. right? After the intake process, we move into setting intentions. And this goes back to what I said previously. Why, why would you like to work with these substances? What do you hope to get out and out of it? And how will you know if it's successful, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like a road trip. Mm -hmm. If I want to get to Texas from Michigan, I, I can't just start heading south. I, I, I need to put mm -hmm. it in my GPS, right? So it's giving a little guidance to the mycelium teachers or whatever substance you're utilizing. And do you find that people are able to build this roadmap? and it actually works or do the, some people think they want to go somewhere and then the, the mushroom teachers are actually like actually no you kind of need to go this way this is actually where we're supposed to go perfect point yes yeah. so so we set intentions loosely right okay. and then we don't go in with expectations mm -hmm. because you hit the the nail on the head these substances give us what we need not what we want True. so yes yeah, sometimes and i've and i've experienced this and i've i've learned to i've learned to manipulate my in intentions well um, um to word them wisely right mm -hmm. but um yeah there's been times where i know that i was hiding from something so i would set kind of a, 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 a superficial mm -hmm. intention right thinking thinking like i could outsmart these mm -hmm. substances mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's real cute, but we both know this is where the work mm -hmm. is needing to be yeah. done right now, right? You can't skip that part. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. It, now, with that being said, going into an experience without an intention and just being curious and being open, that too is an intention. And that's a beautiful okay. intention. Okay, cool. So, so people can go in and, and just like, you know, I, I wouldn't invite, I, I'm not even going to put that in there. Um, people can go in just out of curiosity and that is an, it's a beautiful intention. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with like, oh, I don't have this like profound thing I'm working on. You know, there's no disrespect to utilize these substances mm -hmm. out of curiosity um, safely. Right. Mm -hmm. And with respect. Um, so, um, so yeah, intentions. And then we move into the third in, which is the in space portion. And this is where we're working with the substance. So if mm -hmm. it's if it's the microdosing mastermind, it's that's that whole 12 week container, right? If it's a retreat, it's that whole retreat container. Mm -hmm. um, it's community circle, it's that one night container in space. Um, after that, we move into integration and that's where we start looking at the intention, the wisdom that came out of it. And now how do we integrate this in our life, right? Mm. How do we walk away from this creating some type of change, whether, whether we're creating something or eradicating something from our life, what's going to be different because we had this experience? What's going to be different because maybe our, our, our thought process is a little bit differently. How are we going to move forward with this information? So that three months down the road, it's not like we find ourselves, you know, feeling like, why did I even do that? I feel mm -hmm. the exact same way I did mm -hmm. before going into the experience, right? So regardless of how I work with people, more importantly, that's the process that we follow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think it's very interesting that you have sort of this, this aftercare. I think it's, that's a really interesting point is you do a lot of work in the, in the experience itself. But this is, it can be very messy. Usually there's a lot of, it's kind of like you've got this big bundle of clothes is what I imagine. You've got this big bundle of clothes and it's like you just throw it all. And it's like now you're reorganizing how they're all stacked. So unless you actually go around afterwards and like pick them up and fold them and put them nicely back where they are, you're just going to scoop them all back up and you've just got this big messy pile still. 
So what you're saying is after you do this experience and you've sort of like exploded this all out and you can see it in a different perspective, it's about reformulating how everything is organized. And that's a very important part of this. And that, that's actually something you do after the experience when you're in a, say a, a normal conscious state. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And so just to, just a um, all of my clients from the last day of, of their program or the last experience, there's always an additional 30 days mm-hmm. of like integration support mm-hmm. after that as well. Um, but yeah, you want to be in, um, I'm going to have a minute. Mm-hmm. There are circles that can happen right after mm-hmm. the ceremony, which I do in my community circle. Um, and one integration circle is not integrating the work. Mm-hmm. That may be integrating the experience you just had, mm-hmm. right? Sharing it, however, whatever that is, mm-hmm. acknowledging it, validating it. Um, but it's not integrating it into your life. So it's, mm-hmm. it's yeah, I think sometimes when I listen to some facilitators or I'm in some of these groups, I think there may be um, a couple of different views of integration. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like I had, there's um, somebody that I know went on a, a retreat and I lost a retreat and I just, I offered, Hey, when you get home, if you need integration support, I'm here. And his response was, well, they have a couple hours of integration support after, after ceremonies. And I just, it's just like, that is not, so, so yes, I understand you're integrating that experience, but people, um, people will get a lot further and they will optimize their journey if they look at mm-hmm. integration a little bit deeper than that, mm-hmm. right? Um, integration is really the work. Like mm-hmm. I said, the, the in space, that's, that's just the, that's the prep work. Mm-hmm. Everything up until the integration is really the prep work. Who are you going to be with this experience and what comes afterwards? Because we're not going to go through our life on these substances, mm-hmm. Right. The goal is, is to create a life of, of ease for ourselves to navigate all the human mm-hmm. emotions from one end of the spectrum to the other and to move through those with ease. Can we, how do we cultivate that? I really like that. That sounds, it's like when you, when you hear, oh, you do psychedelic group experiences, I can imagine the, the initial gut instinct of many people might be like, that's irresponsible. That doesn't sound safe. But then with what you're saying now, it's like, well, this is actually very professionally done. It's very responsible. It's very aware. It's very supported. It's very, it's a, it's a very, very caring environment, which is, I would say it is required because when you're doing these things, it's like, like you just said a minute ago, you get what you need, not what you want. And sometimes what you need is to see things about yourself or about your experiences that you don't actually want to see. And you need a delicate, loving space to be held for you to, to go through that. And in many ways, you're, you can kind of come out of these experiences very destroyed in many ways. Like, who am I now? Like, that was who I was. Who am I now? So this, this reintegration, reintegration process is, in a way, sounds sort of like, almost like ego rehabilitation. This helps you reformulate who you are after this experience of this new level of awareness that you get to experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to speak a little bit on the container, you know, um, there are many people out there who feel that just because they've had some psychedelic experiences that they're trained to hold space Mm -hmm. as a facilitator. Mm -hmm. Um, I am in a very in-depth program with, with my mentors, Tom Colwitty, um, the condor approach, and it is very in-depth what, what one, what it's beneficial for one to know going into holding these spaces to create Mm -hmm a safe container, mm-hmm. um, not only on a physical level and a physical container, but I'm trying to watch nervous system cues. So I can tell when somebody is moving into, um, an elevated, mm-hmm. you know, um, nervous system state. And, and if it goes beyond a certain point, I'm also trying to go and, and help down regulate that nervous system in the midst of a journey, which can be mm-hmm. difficult. Right. Um, and, and so oftentimes where you, when you hear about people having a bad trip, it, a lot of times they're unguided, mm. right? And when you get into an elevated state like that, and if you can't find your way out or you don't know how to pull your way out of it, you can end up in a very difficult mm-hmm. cycle. So when you're utilizing this work with a facilitator like myself that is trained not only on like, I'm just going to keep you safe and, and I know about these substances and stuff like that. No, I'm, 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 I've gone through a lot of, um, you know, trauma work, um, learning about different constructs and, 
and, and learning about the nervous system and how these things are impacting us and what to watch for. There's a lot really that goes into holding mm-hmm. um, a container like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I do, I am, I, I do pride myself. My containers are very safe. And, and I, and I say that um, um, I can say that with, you know, confidently because that's the feedback that my clients give mm-hmm. me that they do feel safe to go mm-hmm. um, and do the deep work. And I know that my containers are safe because they are going in to do the deep work. Mm-hmm. If you put yourself into a situation to try to do this deep work and your body does not feel safe, you are not going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're only going to go yeah. as deep as your body is going to, mm-hmm. to allow you, as deep as it feels safe, right? So a lot of rapport, um, there's, there's a lot of work before somebody sits with me in session. Um, we, there's always an exploration call, usually 30 to 45 minutes. It's an, a, you know, an introduction, a free call. Um, if they move on, we get on an onboarding call that's usually 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and then we touch base again prior to the experience, you know, so there, we're building this rapport. And then, like I said, we begin with that mini dose session so that that's, the person is still very much aware, very much in control of their body and, and yet just open enough to be thinking a little bit differently mm-hmm. and to feel how that substance feels coming on in their mm-hmm. body without it taking them too far, right? And then by the time we come together for a larger session, that, that trust has been built mm-hmm. for both of us because it's just mm-hmm. as important for me as a facilitator yes. to know that I'm safe with somebody, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you're facilitating these experiences, are you also on the same supplements that they're on? I am not. No, mm-hmm. no. You're in a, a... There, are, there are some people who hold circles mm-hmm. like that. Those would mm-hmm. be considered more like shaman or Sherpas. Mm-hmm. Um, that is not a space that I'm... I'm in in this moment okay. i don't know that i'll get to that space okay. yeah okay interesting for me i feel much more comfortable knowing that um like when i'm going into a space um my modernized mind feels much more comfortable mm-hmm. knowing that there is somebody completely sober there mm-hmm. that if something happens there's somebody that can think clearly mm-hmm. and and can take care of me mm-hmm. right and so that's important for me to make sure that that's available for okay. my clients as cool. well good to know and with regards to the substances that your clients will be taking, how do they get them? Yeah. Um, that's the magic question, right? Mm-hmm. Um, clearly with these substances being illegal, that's, that's something that's between them and, and their source. Mm-hmm. Um, I do advise people to not purchase them off from Instagram, even though there are a million places selling them on Instagram mm-hmm. and social media. Uh, for many reasons. Number one, you don't know what's in that capsule you're getting, especially mm-hmm. when microdosing is in a subperceptual thing. Mm-hmm. Also, some places have been putting substances such as fentanyl in their microdoses to get you hooked to their microdoses. Wow. Not a safe option. Um, the safest option, honestly, is to grow your own. And I do mm. recommend my clients to do that. It's perfectly legal to buy spores and there are amazing kits available. It doesn't cost a lot of money and it doesn't take a lot of time. And it doesn't take a lot of space and sim- it's fairly simple to do. Mm. So ideally, um, somebody is able to, to grow their own or they can stay um, one or two people removed from the person who is growing them so that they're confident in knowing that what they're getting um, was grown with love and good intention, mm-hmm. right? We want to know what we're getting. It, it mm-hmm. does matter when we're working with these spiritual um, woo-woo substances, right? There is an element there that that is important and, and a substance that's grown by... Um, Jim Bob watching porn while he's <laughs> shooting up crack in his garage is is gonna you're gonna have a different product than you yeah. are from the person who is is praying and meditating over and putting Reiki and, and stuff into the substance that you're mm-hmm. taking. Big difference. Um, and I know that from personal experience. Mm-hmm. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Um, so those are something... those are the, those are the best ways to, to okay. do it at, at, at this point in time. If somebody is interested in in working with me, I I um, reach out. Don't let that stop you at this mm-hmm. point by saying like, oh, I don't have access. Um, reach out to me. We can talk about it. Mm-hmm. That's something as, you can help them the, with. Yeah, with a second how I can support with with mm-hmm. where to get the spores, mm-hmm. where to get kits. Mm-hmm. Um, there there are some safe options around the world. You know mm-hmm. that I can I can. I can share Can- mm-hmm. Canadians have dispensaries at this point, which is awesome. Great. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So I'd love it's, to hear it's, that. it's starting. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. beginning as far as accessibility. Cool. Okay. Well, fantastic. So I have two questions that I'd like to ask everybody before we wrap up the episode. So first of all, what is something that 
anybody watching in any situation at any point in their life could do right now that would benefit them positively, improve their health in some way that is either very cost effective or preferably free? Just pause this podcast right in this moment and take five very deep cleansing breaths as deep down as you can and exhale them with the loudest like sigh that you possibly can out of your mouth. And then remember that your breath is always with you. And at any given point in time, all we are actually required to do is to breathe in and out. Cool. Okay. Very good. Mm-hmm. I get, I get that one a lot, the breathing, cause it's, it is such a fundamental. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Okay. Last question. So let's say you step into an elevator. You've got 30 seconds in the elevator till you get to the floor that you want to get to. And there's a very influential member of the government standing in there with you. And you have 30 seconds to try and impart some information, something he should change about policy to improve the health of, of the nation. And he's open, he's receptive to everything. You can tell him anything you want and he's, he's receptive to this. What would you tell him? Oh man, that's a doozy. <laughs> Only 30 seconds. 30 seconds, elevator. Okay. Yep. Um, he's getting out. <laughs> yeah, I would let him know that I was a stay-at-home mom who struggled with mental health for a lot of years. It, it led me to a point where I contemplated suicide and leaving my children because the way that um, we handle the pharmaceuticals in our country. Um, and um, I did find my own way out by utilizing substances that are Um, loved, welcome, and cherished in other cultures and in other parts of the world legally. So it would be to try and change their policy around around those substances? That's a loaded question, but yes, I suppose. And at the (laughs) same time, I also want to acknowledge that legalization is not the best for it. This is a whole nother conversation, Mm -hmm. but for me, legalization is not the best route for these things because legalization means... um, you know, restrictions and Mm -hmm. and control and government involvement. And at the end of the day, these are mushrooms that grow out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, And and the government does not have any business what I do with my own consciousness, with my own healing and uh, with with the plants Mm. that I was given. So yes, um, on a human level, I do know policy needs to be changed for Mm -hmm. these things to be accessible um, to other humans. Um, decriminalization Mm -hmm. would be a better option right um yeah um and on my my higher level i uh it would be silly to even have a conversation with somebody in the government because i'm not one who allows them to dictate what Mm -hmm. i do or do Mm -hmm. not do with myself Mm -hmm. okay (laughs) i might just offer him a glass of ayahuasca and call it good (laughs) and then let him walk out the elevator and figure it out peace out bro have fun (laughs) (laughs) give some to your friends (laughs) cool okay Fantastic. That's been excellent. So um, if anyone is interested in working with you, talking with you more, or has any questions to you, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Yeah. So they can find me on Facebook, um, either my, my profile under Miranda Lynn Vyers. I do. I'm also there on uh, the Emerging Soul and the Psychedelic Mama. Um, I have a free group, self-love, self-care and psychedelics. Um, you can reach out to me in any of those spaces. Also my website, the Emerging Soul. There will be, um, you know, information about my services, some information about my services, mm-hmm. um, and then also a link to, to schedule a free exploration call. And that's just an opportunity for us to see where somebody is, um, where they would like to be, and if what I offer is uh, a good, good fit. Fantastic. Cool. So all of those links will be included down below. So you'll, you'll provide those to me and I'll stick them all below. So if you need any of those links, they are just down there. So you can just find them, click them, and get in contact with Miranda. So thank you very much. It's been fantastic to have you. You've been a wonderful guest. And I'm sure we will have you again in the future because we just scratched the surface. There's so much more to talk about. I know you do more than psychedelics. There's, as you said, there's the nutrition component. There's the there's Reiki. We could do a whole class on Reiki. That would be really sh- interesting, I'm sure. I'm sure you use that a lot in your experiences too. So I'm sure we'll have you on. You've been a lovely guest and I look forward to having you again soon. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. You've been listening to the Holistic Healing Collective with William Dickinson. Our passion is to heal with energy, holistic, and plant medicine using a science-based blend of mind, body, and spirit. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and tell a friend or two. We'll be back soon. 
But in the meantime, find us on Facebook at the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast and Support Group. We'd love to see you. Take care, be well, and see you next time on the Holistic Healing Collective.